Welcome back, everybody. The reasons why we are getting a little glimpse of some of these religions is so that we can have a better discernment in the future for when we dive deeper into future topics and future uh, religion and reality and so forth. So, thanks for joining me. This is Religion Part 2, Buddhism of India. There are roughly 165,000 Buddhists in North America and an estimate of 500 million worldwide. Buddhism existed 500 years before Jesus of Nazareth. In the West, Buddha's teachings still remains unclear, mainly due to the findings of many versions of his teachings. So we are going to try to understand the man himself, Buddha, by exploring the philosophies of Gautama. In Buddhism, a collection of sayings, discourses, dialogues, and studies handed down the generations by the wise monks is called the Pitakas. There are three types of Pitakas, Vinaya, Sutta, and Abhidhamma. The language is called Bali, and all the Pitakas is the main philosophies of Hinayana Buddhism and the discourses is just like a language like almost like a chant uh, by the way Siddhartha Gautama that's his first and last name Prince of the Sakya Kingdom is the founder of Buddhism born at Lumbini Garden in 567 BC near Kapil Vastu and lived till 487 BC. Since Gautama was a prince, he lived a luxurious lifestyle, who his father, the king, made sure of it because he feared that his only son one day might take on the lifestyle of a monk and leave him without an heir. The king feared this because this was one of the prophecies foretold to him. And the prophecy rang true, but before Gautama departed from his kingdom, he provided his father with a grandson, heir to the throne. One of the reasons Gautama was seeking monkhood was because he had to figure out how to escape death by the search of wisdoms. So one night he took one last look at his wife and son while they were still asleep, went to the border of his kingdom with his servant and had his royal robe sent back to the palace with the servant. Now traveling alone wearing only a lion cloth and carrying a bowl for begging, searching for the knowledge to end all sufferings and seek ultimate wisdom. Seven years pass through all the mortifications, trances and meditations, but all was unsuccessful. One day after recovering from a debilitating fasting method, he gained an insight that revealed to him the reasons for his failures and a way to attain happiness. This insight later on is known as enlightenment. Through this insight came the principle, desire for what will not be attained ends in frustration. Therefore, to avoid frustration, avoid desiring what will not be attained. Unhappiness consists in not getting what you want. If you get what you want, you will be happy, of course. If you want what you get, you thereby get what you want. And when you do not want what you get, you thereby do not get what you want. In short, human happiness is wanting what you receive and unhappiness is not wanting what one receives. When Buddha was still a young prince, he dined on anything his heart desired and had any woman that he wanted, but yet still unhappy because he still desired something more. When he forced himself to live the lifestyle of starvations and sufferings, he experienced unhappiness because the goal he was searching for evaded him and he still desired something more. So he concluded that if self-indulgence and mortifications won't reach the ultimate goal, it must be somewhere in between referred to as the middle way. When one gives up caring whether his desires are satisfied, 
can he become happy? This viewpoint does not eliminate desire, only the desire to have one's desire satisfied and not frustrated. So with this logic, the middle way turns out to be the way things are, meaning that is the way things are in the universe, living in the here and now, the present moment. Happiness derives from wanting to change that which cannot be changed or from wanting to keep the same that which cannot be kept the same. Gautama's principle is a way to eliminate all unhappiness and he refuses to answer unanswerable questions by any critics. Buddha neither affirms nor denies things such as the existence or non-existence of God, whether the law of karma holds or does not hold, the existence or non-existence of a next life, is there a soul or not a soul? These types of questions that Gautama refuses to answer his fellow monks simply because for those seeking happiness, the only important thing to understand is not whether something exists or does not exist, but whether whatever may be, or are they willing to accept it whichever way it comes? Bear in mind that all of Gautama's principle in Buddhism is not 100% conveyed to us because the writings of persons who interpret them as they understood or misunderstood them is entirely possibly inaccurate. Another of Gautama's principle is the Four Truths and the Eight Folds. The Four Noble Truths are Number one, all is suffering because all is changed. Number two, the cause of sufferings is desire. Number three, to remove suffering, remove desire. Number four, the way to remove desire is by the Eightfold Path. Now what is the Eightfold Path? Summed up here, number one, the right view. Number two, the right intentions. Number three, the right speech. Number four, the right action. Number five, the right livelihood. Number six, the right efforts. Number seven, the right concentration. Number eight, the right mindfulness. I have to also mention that there are two movements in Buddhism, Theravada and Sanyavada. They are opposite viewpoints on the subject of having no soul and impermanence. Theravadians believe that existence requires no creator and the doctrine of impermanence eliminates a notions of God and the soul. Salvation is achieved in Nirvana when the ego realizes the illusions and thus gives up mistakenly that the world is real and permanent. That includes the soul also. The explanation of reincarnation can still be possible even without having a soul is by the law of karma or of causality or by the dependent origination doctrine. The law of karma favors no one. Each person's sufferings is ultimately due to his own greed. Therefore, praying to Lord Buddha for what he does not deserve creates bad karmas. And according to the Theravidans philosophy, Lord Buddha is unable to answer your prayers for he has already reached Nirvana. Now we're going to cover the other opposing viewpoint, the Sonyavada. So the Theravada is known as the Hinayana Buddhism and the Sanya Vada is the Mahayani Buddhism evolved for more than 20 centuries in the Far East. This includes China, Mongolia, Korea, Tibet, and Japan. The Mahayana, which is the Sanya Vada, believes that we need to gather and involve others in order to achieve enlightenment, whereas the Hinayana, which is the Theravada, is a self-help religion and no person can help one in his personal struggles. Some of the Sanyavada philosophy is existent or non-existent, is neither is nor is not, nor both is and is not, nor neither is nor is not existent. Is it permanent or impermanent? It is neither permanent nor impermanent, nor both nor neither. Is it conscious? 
it is neither conscious nor unconscious nor both nor neither and so on we are going to end it here thanks for tuning in until next time guys put a dragons out